Hey, I'm doing this recording now. Um, shortly after I just released an amazing dialogue I had with Redeemed Zoomer. Um, that went really well. I was so happy with it. Um, you should check, definitely check it out on my channel, on his channel. Um, if you don't know who Redeemed Zoomer is, you should totally check out um, everything he does. He has an, a good Instagram page and he has an amazing YouTube channel um, where he talks a lot about um, how to revive classical Protestantism in uh, our increasingly secular age, which I think is a phenomenal um, goal. However, the point of this video is not why you should be generally classically Protestant, but why you should be Anglican. Uh, I've been having this kind of feeling re lately. There's not enough guys out there who are the kind of, uh, the joke I always give is, begum Anglican. Like, there's lots of internet Lutherans or ortho bros or Catholics who are aggressively trying to proselytize all other Christians into their specific denomination. And Anglicans don't do this. Um, I think it's nice, but I also think it's, you know, it's somewhat pointless. Uh, um, or it's not necessarily pointless, it's not strategically wise. I am Anglican for reasons that I think are good. I'm not just Anglican because I fell into this denomination. I chose this denomination and there are good reasons to be Anglican. Uh, in fact, I've gone in other videos, I think Angl Anglicanism is the best Christian denomination for Catholicity, uh, lowercase c, Catholicity, um, universality, um, and I'll get into why uh, as this video goes on. First, I'm going to go through my six reasons, and I'm going to break them down more um, individually. Firstly, Orthodox Anglicanism has unity on the essentials. The Trinity, the actual Orthodox faith as practiced by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church for age immemorial is present in Anglicanism. But the things that are not essential, the things that are tertiary, Anglicans allow for disagreement on, which I think is also important. You have to be able to know what hills are worth dying on. Thirdly, Anglicans are one of the only Protestant denominations who really claim apostolic succession. Um, so if you're really concerned about, ooh, does all, do all these claims Roman Catholics and Orthodox are making about the necessity of bishops and the necessity of the laying on of hands and the authority given to the apostles, and you're reading the Bible and you see how strong the authority is that these uh, 12 apostles were given by, by Christ, and you say, where are those guys in... Um, my congregationalist, non-denominational church. Well, we've got them, and they're visible, and we, you know, we have that kind of clearance in a way that no other Protestant denomination can consistently claim to, or desires to even to claim to. The fourth reason to be an Anglican is the sacraments. So, while some Protestant denominations won't even call baptism and the Lord's Supper a sacrament, um, Anglicans affirm the importance of those two sacraments by including some a kind of lesser status for the other five sacraments that are normal, normally observed by Roman Catholics. And so, because we don't think that there's something, um, there, are, there are the dominical sacraments, we'll say, let's say, the ones given to us by the Lord, and then there are the um, ecclesiastical sacraments, things that the, the church on earth, made up by of, as the body of Christ have developed over time. And we've got all of those in the Anglican tradition as well. The fifth reason to be Anglican, um, and keep in mind, these aren't exactly in any preferential order. So it's not like any one of these reasons is better than the other. But the fifth reason is, is history, right? Anglicans can trace our Reformation back to the Reformation. The people that were initially cutting themselves off from Rome at the time were people who had some genuine complaints, but also were able to preserve um, some of those, uh, the good parts of medieval Christianity while returning to a more um, apostolic period. And the last one, which I'll get into, uh, is liturgy. Anglicans have a one of the most um, consistent, one of the most, in my opinion, beautiful and, and reverential liturgies and liturgical traditions of any of the Christian denominations, let alone the Protestant denominations. So 
I'm going to talk about those today. Firstly, I think one of the, the, the most important reason is the unity on essentials. Um, this is why you should be an Orthodox Anglican, not necessarily um, what a lot of churches have kind of become in the quote-unquote Anglican world, where they don't care about the essentials of the faith anymore. But Anglicanism can and will and does always claim to follow the creeds, all of the ecumenical creeds. Um, you know, there's something in there, too, about recognizing the authority of the episcopate, right? So we still think that those creeds were authoritative in their own right, and that they, they're, there's some power and unity there to affirming those things. Um, if you read the 39 Articles of Religion, they are broad, but they're also specific. And if you don't agree with those things, like the Trinity, like the divinity of Christ, all of these things, you're not an Anglican in, in a meaningful sense. And so we get to have that kind of unity and strength of doctrine um, on those essential characteristics, the things that have always been observed by the Catholic and Apostolic faith um, that Christians have always thought was essential. You know, uh, the way I like to bill it to people is if you went to, um, you know, lots of people are very comfortable saying this today, especially Catholics and Orthodox, that, oh, actually, if you went to a church in the 5th or 4th or 3rd century, uh, no, none of the modern churches would look like that. But Anglicans actively tried to, the Anglican reformers, uh, John Jewell goes into this in depth at the beginning of the Anglican Reformation. The point of Anglicanism is to return to that um, authentic version of Christianity, removed by removed yes of the accretions that we were that separated us from the Roman Catholic tradition, but to return to those some of those things. Lots of Anglicans and Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox people, oftentimes feel like we've got a lot in common. I always say that I'm, I'm effectively, you know, there are Anglo-Catholics and there are Reformed Anglicans. I'm effectively uh, Orthodox Anglican or Anglo-Orthodox as opposed to Anglo-Catholic. I think in, in some sense the Western Rite was preserved in the Anglican tradition. And the Orthodox, whether or not they vocally admit it, the Western Rite in Orthodoxy is the tradition and the liturgy that was developed by Anglicans for the most part. And we'll get into more into Western Orthodoxy and liturgy later. But what I would say is that Anglicans historically and today, you know, think about the Kigali statement, we are able to strongly affirm the essentials of the Christian life and to preserve the sacraments and to preserve the word um, faithfully in our tradition. The second thing is we are still lenient and not dogmatic and not, um, I would say, hyper-scrupulous like some other Christian traditions are. Like I would argue, Roman Catholicism and the Reformed tradition can kind of veer into some people developed very good explanations of the Bible, and I won't say that either of them are inher inherently or obviously wrong. They, they developed really good explanations of, of doctrines and parts of the Bible that sometimes seem to have contradictions, but they can usually explain them. But, you know, who knows which of these opinions are true? God never came down and delivered Reformed theology to us. God never came down uh, and delivered Molinism to us. Um, these are kind of mysteries, and Anglicanism is comfortable, as is the Eastern Orthodox tradition, by the way, in having a, a kind of mysterious understanding of things like the sacraments. Um, there are lots of Anglican positions on things like the sacraments. We you have to believe the real presence, which because that's biblical, and that's historic, and that's reasonable. I mean, they're... The three sources of Anglican doctrine are the Bible, primarily, prima scriptura, right? Tradition, so what has the church always believed and always professed, and reason. So sometimes, if you just think about two logical statements, one, they can't both be the same, or they can't both be true at the same time. You know, you have to figure out a way to reconcile them. And those are the three ways we come to doctrine. And if your opinion uh, isn't found in either of those three things, or if all three of those things agree on one doctrine, that's how Anglicans tend to come to um, our dogmas or, or doctrinal beliefs. So, um, on issues like the mode of the real presence, I know Anglicans who believe in consubstantiation, I know Anglicans who believe in uh, a more spiritual presence, um, although I would say to some extent some spiritual presence, you know, veers into 
um, veers into disagreeing with the arguments for the real presence. For instance, if you read the early Anglicans, they believe in stuff something similar to receptionism, that there is real presence, but it's received only once a faithful person partakes in the Eucharist. So that's not saying that the, the, the Spirit is always present in people doing this. It's saying something like it become, Christ's body does become present, you know, substantially when you partake in the Eucharist through reception, not just that there's some vague spiritual presence. Um, but so while we can disagree on the mode of, of substantial presence of the Eucharist, of Christ's body in the Eucharist, we still agree that there is some substance as opposed to maybe the Lutherans or the Catholics who have their exact way of it being worked out, right? I mean, if you look into church history, the doctrine of transubstantiation appears relatively late in church history as an explanation. But Anglicans have no problem affirming the more broad versions of real presence that are found universally in, in church history. Things like baptismal regeneration, which are found universally in church history, we affirm. Now, what does that mean very literally? We're allowing a little bit more of a diversity once you accept the the received tradition on these issues. So while there's unity on the essentials, the, on the, the non-essential details, we can reasonably allow for um, diversity, which prevents schism in both senses, right? Because unity on the essentials, the truth and the, of the doctrines unite us into one church and make sure that we're still professing Christ's church here on earth. But then leniency in the non-essentials stops, for instance, some Anglican gets convinced of Reformed theology, or some Anglican gets convinced of Molinism, they're not just going to have to leave Anglicanism to start their own church. And I think that that's powerful and important um, part of our tradition. The third reason you should be Anglican, I think, is, is apostolic succession. Um, I, I would test any of you to read the early church fathers. As soon as they start writing, and as soon as we have writings from the church fathers, they're telling people, listen to your bishops. Clement is telling people to listen to their bishops. Paul, in the epistles that we all recognize as scripture, are saying, listen to your elders. They have power and authority here on earth, more so than the laity do in governing the church, because everyone has a purpose. And, and to some extent, there is some lay participation in Anglicanism more so than I would say in Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism. But we still have the ability to discipline um, church churchmen on issues of doctrine, in issues of dogma. And we can trace our bishops back to the age of the apostles. So if, you know, if there's some natural balance, I think, there are lots of passages in scripture about um, someone um, spreading the word of God, not a part of the organized structure. This happens with Moses uh, and Joshua, where Joshua approaches Moses talking about two um, people preaching the word of God in, in Israel. And Joshua says, hey, these guys are preaching, but they're not with us. We should throw them away. And Moses says, you shouldn't do that. And this is paralleled in the New Testament when Peter, I think, comes to um, Jesus and says, there are some who are prophesying in your name, but they are not with us. And Jesus says, whoever is not against us is for us. And to include them. And so Anglicans can do that like lots of Protestants can do, where we say there are other church bodies that are not a part of our structure that are totally legitimate. This is basically branch theory, right? However, it's not like Jesus said, oh, Peter, you're not even the church anymore in some meaningful sense, or, oh, Peter, you're thinking entirely wrongly. Um, you, you don't have any office. You don't have any authority, Peter. Um, you're not a bishop. You're not an apostle. It doesn't make any sense. I have no idea why you're saying that he's not with us because the church doesn't have any structure at all. Jesus instead says, no, you, he doesn't rebuke his uh, ecclesiology, he rebukes his attitude, which I think Anglicanism is perfectly situated to do uh, in the church today. As we have that both and, we have the apostolic succession and branch theory, which allows for us to be properly inclusive and properly exclusive. And so connected to apostolic succession is the sacraments, in my opinion. Um, if you're worried that sacraments are not valid unless properly um, ordained by a priest, you know, maybe you had a conversation with some Catholic or Orthodox person who made a convincing argument for 
the church hierarchy being needed to administer the sacraments in the body of Christ. Um, Anglicans have that apostolic succession and that proper understanding of the sacraments. We think baptism regenerates. We we think that the, their real presence is is going on in the deliverance of the Eucharist. We do weekly mass, right? Weekly administration of the Lord's Supper. Um, we believe in infant, infant baptism, which is a historic position. And so while we can we can properly, you know, I think some of the reformers were upset or, or concerned with the fact that some of those ecclesiastical sacraments, like holy matrimony or um, unction, were being elevated to the same level as the dominical sacraments, Lord's Supper and baptism. We can keep the dominical sacraments above the other sacraments, but still observe them. In, in um, the Book of Common Prayer, holy matrimony and all of the other sacraments have their place. There is a liturgy for them. There is some reverence to them. The, you know, I think Paul Vanderclay often says that if evangelicals could get a third sacrament, it would be holy matrimony. It would be marriage. And Anglicans recognize that there is something sacramental about marriage. There's something covenantal about marriage. There are lots of lines in the Bible that seem to say from the mouth of Christ and from God the Father in, in Genesis that these un bonds of union are sacramental or they're compared to the re-knitting of, you know, uh, of, of the world. And in, in some sense, I think, related to that, is Anglicans have a very strong kingdom mindset, kingdom theology, right? Uh, in my conversation with Redeem Zoomer, he, he immediately could recognize that I've read a lot of N.T. Wright. Um, N.T. Wright talks about this as an Anglican a lot, but this is a, a historic Christian and Anglican position that there's something about the church being united and being a, 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 a front towards perpetuating dogma and orthodoxy in the world. If you read John Jewell, who's living in the early Reformation age, he thinks of Protestantism and the Reformation as this glorious return to a proper propagation of dogma with, the, with you know, changing as little as possible from the medieval church, keeping everything that does not contradict scripture, and perpetuating the, the, the true, holy, Catholic, and apostolic faith to the best of our ability here on earth. And that's what the kingdom is. It's not just this kind of very low or shallow, um, everyone just needs a relationship with Jesus and the church is kind of the, the means of evangelism for that personal relationship. Anglicanism has built into it the administration of the sacraments and the word and the propagation of God's kingdom on earth as one of the core essentials of our faith um, that I think lots of other lower church Protestant denominations are missing. And this kind of wraps into one of the, the fifth reason, which is history. Um, there are Anglicans who have been writing on these issues since the Reformation. And Anglicans aren't afraid to go to look back before the Reformation and to, to affirm a lot of the, the um, doctrine that occurred in the kind of hazy periods of the Middle Ages. And people will point out, Thomas Aquinas doesn't even technically agree with all of the modern Roman Catholic positions. There was a lot more ambiguity in the Middle Ages, and there were lots of people who we would probably consider Protestant in a lot of their opinions on, for instance, Mary, or um, uh, ecclesiology, or the role of the Pope. Um, I mean, if you if you want to look into the idea that the Middle Ages was universally agreed that the Pope hat was su supreme, look at the conciliar controversies. I think in some ways... Anglicans have inherited that medieval conciliarism attitude that the bishops do have this authority when they're gathered together, which is we have in common with orthodoxy. Um, and you can kind of trace that back. Lots of Anglicans will trace back the, content, our, the Anglican church to the pre-Catholicization of the church in Britain, what's called the Celtic church. Um, before there were any um, Roman-affiliated bishops in, in Great Britain, there were churches uh, and there was Christianity in uh, what's called insular Christianity a lot of time by academics in, in, in Great Britain, which didn't have to do with the Pope and it didn't have to do with the papal hierarchy. Um, but in a lot of ways, it wouldn't necessarily be recognized as some kind of low church evangelical strand. There were a lot of similarities to, to Roman Catholicism and a lot of modern uh, Anglicans try to revive some of that, the energy of um, the early Celtic church. I think there's even East, there's even East, 
Eastern Orthodox affiliated um, churches who call themselves Celtic Orthodox, right? There's this recognition that prior to interventions from Rome, there was something, there was an Orthodox faith in, in Great Britain that was not Roman, but was Catholic and Orthodox. And Anglicanism can trace our, our history even that far back. But even more recently, we can trace our, our, our lineage to the formularies in the Reformation. You know, this isn't just like, oh, I guess some got random American in the 1900s was the real guy who understood Christianity perfectly, um, despite all the, the, the Reformation um, happening prior to that. And he, even though it's completely different from all of the recorded traditions we have in Christianity, um, Anglicanism has that link. You know, I think it's hard for, in my opinion, it's hard for, say, a Baptist to have a conversation with Catholics where a Baptist has to make the argument, say, that, like, it, there was a major, prominent, public, doctrinal apostasy on the very mode of baptism for a large portion of church history. But all the Anglican has to say is there was some confusion on justification a bit um, in the Roman Catholic Church. There was some confusion on the authority of the Pope, but most of the medieval church, we totally affirm. 98% of what the medieval church was doing, we are totally okay with. We're not saying there was some great apostasy. We're just saying there was something that needed to be clarified in a direction that the papacy was not going to clarify uh, those doctrines. So we still have that historic link, and we still have that kind of what's called often called the via media, right? There, uh, between Protestantism and, and Roman Catholicism. Um, that we can still affirm the history of the church in, in that sense. And the last thing, and I know this is a, actually a very practical one. In my experience, lots of people say, may, most, you know, if you go to a, a, a congregation on any given day and you ask why some of the congregants actually are in the pews at Anglican churches, is the liturgy. Um, I went to an Episcopal church recently, um, although I'm not usually a, a, a attending an Episcopal church, I'm ACNA. But I went to an Episcopal church where a bunch of the guys after the service recognized which rite was being said for the Great Thanksgiving and they thought something changed about it and they found out it was a third rite that is in like the back of the BCP and they were talking about that forever. But they had the rite one and rite two of the Great Thanksgiving, a part of the liturgy, memorized in heart and it was something essential to them, something deeply um, a part of their faith. You know, a lot of Anglicans, and I think Catholics and Orthodox and lots of other Protestants will, will often use the phrase lex orandi, lex credendi, which is the law of prayer is the law of belief. The way we worship has to be very well regulated so that we can um, make sure that this, what I often call the cognitive cycle, is is creating the kingdom here on earth, right? What what happens a lot of times is we 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 act out our beliefs, but we also believe the things we act out. So liturgy and how we pray and how we worship and how we um, sing the hymns uh, really does affect our beliefs and affects the kingdom and has a, um, a role in, in, in the church. And Anglicans, you know, have this beautiful tradition, inherited tradition of the Book of Common Prayer that goes through how to, to celebrate these... Um, celebrate God in a beautiful, true, and, and wonderful way that I think a lot of maybe more low church, non-liturgical traditions are missing. Um, and we have, it's not like we have just one liturgy that we make sure everyone does. People modify the BCP and depending on the context, but it's still something that binds all of us. I think an, a good example of how this is kind of adapted sometimes is what's called the English Missal, which combines the Roman Catholic liturgy and Latin Mass with English um, and the BCP tradition, and, and lots of Anglo-Catholic parishes have what's called the English Missal, which I think is a beautiful representation of the liturgy. And oftentimes, usually, like you can see in this picture here, it's very well adorned, it's very beautiful. And Anglicans care about the material parts of worship, and, and but retain Protestant identity um, in, in, a, in a meaningful sense uh, that I think a lot of Protestant churches are missing. Um, that's effectively my six best reasons. There's probably more. There's definitely stuff I forgot. You know, if you attend an Anglican parish, there will be things you'll notice. The vestments, the 
the the artwork in the in the church the 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 inherited traditions that are alive in the people who practice anglicanism in a way um the preaching there there are lots of parts that may, of anglicanism that make it this living breathing tradition that is superior to other traditions and i think a lot of anglicans are afraid to say that but we believe it that's why we're anglican you know people that just say well it's my it's the thing that i am comfortable with so that's why i'm an anglican why are you comfortable with it what about this tradition is valuable there's tons of value to traditions that can make us feel at home which anglicanism is perfect at um, and we have to be able to profess that especially in this increasingly anti-liturgical anti-intellectual anti-theological age um anti institutional age we have to be able to affirm all of those things as anglicans and still uh you know prioritize of course the gospel before our denominationalism but still be able to be proud and affirm that the anglican tradition is the closest faith to the practices of the early church it's the it's the continuation of the holy apostolic church uh and catholic church from from the age before papal supremacy. It's the Western Rite Orthodoxy. There's a great video um, that I just watched, which I'll put a link to in the description, which goes into how Anglicanism, which openly affirms branch theory, the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics tacitly affirm branch theory and accept it, but what they're doing is they're just telling people that they're the only one true church. Um, I mean, they, they believe it. I don't want to say that they don't believe in the one true church as a visible institution. They do. But so do we. What we believe is that there is one true visible church, and it's just not limited to Anglicanism. And and there's some... what's and, and that's honest, and that's the truth, and that's what most Christians actually believe. But we shouldn't get caught up in, in, in the acknowledgement of that in not trying to continue, convince people to become Anglican, that there's something valuable and rich and the body of Christ is truly present in the Anglican communion here, um, and in true Orthodox Anglicanism as well, right? I think the on 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 one end, lots of Anglicanism. Uh, I think about 15% of Anglicans in the world that aff- that attend church regularly have kind of fallen into uh, uh, liberalism, which is lamentable, uh, theological liberalism, which is lamentable because what they're basically saying is. Not only are they are they often saying that Christ is not the only way to the Father, which is directly stated in Scripture, they're also not willing to affirm that Anglicanism is one of the most powerful traditions um, for delivering God's kingdom here on earth. Um, and Orthodox Anglicans have to be able to affirm that it is, that the Anglican tradition is that powerful message. All right, thanks for listening to this video. Um, I ho- if you liked the video, be sure to like, subscribe, attend an Anglican church if you're still, um, if you're not, you know, if you're interested. Um, thank you and God bless.